chapter 20. Die Furcht lamped broken wheel. Captain Billy Bob Begg's first scale jump by Warwick Colvin Jr. Chapter 900 slash 1432. Trapped on the yo-yo flow. All was silence as Captain Billy Bob indicated the scale screens and explained what she had learned from the mysterious Professor Pop. We call it folding, but actually we are dissipating and concentrating mass and ratio to size going up scale or down. But what's the urgency of your summoning cap? called out little Rapaldo high in the fold net voicing the question in their hearts. We have just learned that the force which conquered the remains of the first ether and made a quasi-universe of it by means of their secret supercarbon science is now bent on conquering the second ether. But surely such primitive science cannot threaten the integrity and freedom of the second ether, put in young Lieutenant Capricorn Schwartz, the ship's accountant. Threaten it does, dear Capricorn, Captain Billy Bob assured the delicious boy. But you are wise to be dismayed. Let Professor Pop explain. And she stepped aside for the huge greybeard as, the ether dust powdering his tonsia, he addressed the crew and their sweethearts. My dears, began the eminent oldster, it is now believed by some that the power of the singularity to put its stamp on chaos is so considerable that the second ether has scaled herself to its laws rather than their adapting, as we do, to the sometimes whimsical conditions of nature. The only power presently great enough to challenge the natural order of creation, the singularity, is, in the eyes of most intelligences, the personification of pure evil. And old Ridge, the first voice of the singularity, is Satan incarnate. Yet the secret of victory still lies, it is believed, in Ko O Ko, the lost universe. And that is why we are, no matter what detours we take, always on that quest, that journey to Ko O Ko. We believe that what we find there will save us from extinction. There was a gasp from every throat as the enormity of their task was concealed to them, was revealed to them. Yet not one raised a voice against the captain. Instead a cheer broke out, and Bum Bum Wilson jumped on the scale harness, shouting, We'll follow you to the ends of the multiverse and beyond, Captain Billy Bob, if it's for our homes and dear ones. The proud explorer stepped forward, laughing with the joy of their confidence in her to steer them through the scales and win victory over the singularity. She had drunk deeply of the red cup, and now felt the power of the machinoir seeping into her bones. Later, Professor Pop addressed them all over his special omniphone, which broadcast to a range of a hundred thousand scales. They had suspected, but were now certain, that the Singularity's quasi-universe had begun to fall away from natural gravity. These creatures are one with the multiverse, Sam. Only we resist its logic. Only we believe that love can defeat entropy and change the nature of sentient life. We who so readily recognise our own slender grip on immortality and understand that we face extinction at any minute. To the majority of your near immortals, death is a very distant prospect. To ourselves it is more or less immediate. All a question of scale, Sam. We're merely taking advantage of our situation the way we little humans will. We are, if nothing else, the creative force. He smiled and rolled towards us. Yesterday you said you weren't human. I was human as you, Sam, but a rose is a rose. If the key to Ko O Ko lies within the spammer gain, and the only way to contact her is to join the quest for the fishlings, then quest we must, Captain Billy Bob was saying. She was grateful for this renewal of energy. But now all eyes were on the scale screens, which were beginning to tremble with an overload of readings as the odds were measured and each player assigned their chances. What are the fishlings? Professor Pop smiled at little Rapoldo's innocent question. 
originally hardly more than miscellaneous fractal dust moving through the scales in the wake of the spammer game, then an ordinary chaos freescaler. Just as spammer had, her fishlings gradually assumed a generic form and with a spark of sentience became the creatures we seek today. They swarmed around Spammer like pilot fish and made no distinction between themselves and their mothership, who in turn had known them so long and through so many transitions that she believed them to be her natural children. She protected them as fiercely as she protected her crew. In particular, Spammer's captain, Wop Wop, loved her fishlings. They were her sublime optimism personified. Captain Wop Wop still sails with Spammer. They are oddly interdependent now. And, in answer to Little Rapoldo's inevitable second question, ah, the spam again. Now there's a story all its own. Chapter 21 Zydeco Gri Gri Jack Karakwazian had swiveled the co-pilot seat. The view out of the flying boat's forward windscreen was now only in his peripheral vision. Laughing at him, the rose took the ship down an avenue of strawberry-scented crimson columns which fanned into gold-laced polyanthus, blossoming, then engulfing them in a tunnel of glistening jade, stinking of rosemary. Mr. Karakwazian was growing used to these radical changes of colour, scale and image. He had begun to detect similarities correspondences. It was an extraordinary kind of logic, but its basis was not unfamiliar to a Yugador of his rank. What had at first seemed disordered, now betrayed the possibility of design. Each field unfolded its own scale, repeating its unique image with minor variations for something resembling infinity. Primroses enfolded and enfolded them, pink fading to yellow, fading to green fading to deeper yellow, fading to black, fading to pink, enfolding and enfolding them as the flying boat poured its way decisively through the second ether, seeking the concourse of chaos engineers and singularists which awaited their coming before beginning a further round in the game of time. We inhabit the same point in space but on a different scale, she explains. We call this folding. It's how we take newcomers through the multiverse. We're required, we have other means of travelling, but I've always preferred this wonderful old flying boat. It serves its turn, and it isn't nearly as extravagant as your disapproval suggests, Jack. The batteries in those restored engines will last forever. They are Swiss. Look, Sam Oakenhurst leans forward in excitement, peering through a sudden eruption of grey-blue outer coolers, becoming clouds and dissipating as if on a great wind. Look, mes amigos, it is the grey fees at last. And see, our heroes and heroines take their ease before the next step of the game. I can feel her. Pearl Peru needs me. They wait for us to join them. You're as eager as a virgin on his marriage night, Sam, says Jack Karakwazian, who had mistaken the hills for waves. He looked out at the grey river, winding under a grey sky but the charismatic physicality of the chaos engineers and their equally powerful singularity foes battered at them like a furnace, threatening to engulf them. Through the closed windows of the Dornier poured the stink of archetypes and demigods, the vital acrid scent of feral mammals. They reeked of the Minotaur. They triggered ancient terrors and delights. The Dornier descended into Babylon, whose pagan pantheons celebrated an exquisite consummation. Their senses alert to the presence of strangers. The great lords and ladies of the Second Ether looked up incuriously as the plane flew low over their concourse. Their chief attention was reserved for the cosmic energies against which they must soon be pitted. Here were the mighty creatures of Hindu lore, of Egypt, Assyria and Persia. Mr. Karakwazian was enchanted at last. Are these not our lost originals? Possibly, but they are further from the angels than you or me, Jack. The rose speaks softly. 
Mr. Karakwazian's unwilling attention was wholly absorbed. He had no method of resistance. He watched frozen, uncritical. Those gorgeous phantasms floated lazily in the brilliant power fields beyond the grey fees, splashing waves of boiling multi-hued colour across their encrusted and corroded torsos as if ceremoniously bathing. Sam Oakenhurst was searching eagerly for Pearl Peru. Jack Caraquazian could have recognised none but Captain Quelch. The lords and ladies of chaos and singularity bore only the crudest resemblance to their magazine representations. Moreover, the adversaries had grown to resemble one another, as occurs in any march lands, in any long disputed frontier where adversaries become almost indistinguishable. All these monsters displayed bizarre, coral-like formations on heads and bodies. Irregular spurs and growths frequently gave them an insectoid or reptilian beauty. Carapaces of jade, brows of crystal, faceted eyes of jewelish brilliance, helmets fused with bone, metal with flesh, veins with display systems, bearing witness to their million encounters with the less congenial aspects of chaos. Some had taken on the characteristics of the higher mollusks, resembling multicoloured calamari, all sensitive tentacles and huge inquiring eyes, yet still indefinably mammalian. The magazines and even the original Vs had formalised and made more humanoid the appearance and identities of the chaos engineers and their enemies. Here, even Captain Quelch gave off unlikely vitality. His very outline seemed an elaborately artificial disguise, too human for the company. Despite the variations of shape and limbs, each mighty being moved with a certain balletic formality, clearly conditioned by its environment and perceptions, but which seemed ponderous to Mr. Karakwazian. The same fractal dust played about their bodies. They spoke the same language and often had similar names. Both favoured bizarre and awkward prosalactics. It was impossible to know how they distinguished friend from enemy. But when Jack Karakwazian presented this opinion, the Rose put her finger to her lips. Too late, for he had been heard. This was punishable blasphemy. The surge of their anger struck him with physical force. For the first time, he realised how thoroughly the creatures were aware of his presence, his very thoughts. Yet he remained bewildered by their disapproval. He was told that this struggle was the way of things. There was no changing it. This was how the fabric of the multiverse was maintained, how all life was sustained. He would be punished at once and for an indefinite time. The last to question God's evidence and authority had been taken in irons to a vault. This was demonstrated to Jack Karakwazian as he was taken in irons to a vault. Scarcely a dungeon. The vault was vast and for much of the day was filled with sunlight which entered from stained glass windows set in the roof. The glass and the sun made ever-changing patterns of colour and these patterns eventually communicated something to him, touching a sense that had been almost dormant. It was impossible to be bored. The patterns and the pain were a wonderful aid to memory. For one month he was left alone, experiencing profound remorse for his past. For the second month his mother was brought to speak with him every day. By the third month he had figured out the basics of his situation and could make relatively minor alterations to it. He had hope of success, of some kind of redemption. He considered his history. At last Jack was able, by his own efforts, to make the role of page in the entourage of Lady Mo but was captured by a powerful pirate called Oot Raju, who employed a number of minor demons and who forced Jack to play crude games and make humiliating moves at remote provincial terminals until the chance presented itself one day on Venus to escape his disgusting master and become, within a year, the merchant venturer Pearl Peru, famous on all the seas of the green planet. Whereupon she was Pearl Peru, combining Jack Karakwazian's own experience with hers, and Jack was hard-pressed to maintain his own identity under the archetypal force of her personality.
my terror of this unfamiliar existence, which seemed to have absorbed years of my life and yet not physically aged me, I deliberately keep alive. My terror is original to me. It identifies me. But Pearl Peru refuses to be moved by it. Instead, she calls upon my gaming skills, for she now defies the whole singularity as she enters her ship, the Smollett Sphere, and orders her crew to set course for the first ether and home to Venus. We'll take the old solar scaling station. It's still the best. Set the controls for the heart of the sun. You will, the rose tells me, even as this goes on, experience sensations of extraordinary well-being, Jack, and a belief that you have come home. You will believe that the yearnings of your soul have been answered at last, that you have found the perfect equation. You have never been so at ease, so profoundly confident in your power, so complete. It is an illusion. This illusion will pass with familiarity. Pearl's crystallizing bones ache with the weight of her peculiar carapace. Only when absorbing something close to an equal can she feel again those familiar sensations and emotions you enjoy. This is why she welcomes you so greedily. That is her hunger, which you must not fear. For the most part, Pearl's brave enough in her pain, but you must be weary of her taste for melodrama. She's Sam's, Rose. She's for Sam. I could not turn my guilty head to look for my friend who had yearned and suffered for this unison with his heroine. For a mysterious reason, Pearl's rejecting Sam even as she accepts you. He will feel bitterly betrayed, and this, of course, will be of use in the game. Anyone else would be proud to be taken by Captain Billy Bob. Sam believes he could have helped Pearl channel her pain to positive effect, but clearly it has always been you she has wanted, since she came seeking you twice at the Terminal Cafe, and Horace fears you. Don't you, Horace? From somewhere came the garbled sounds of a Latin quotation. The rose seemed to be teasing both the invisible Captain Quelch and me. Well then, I said. I must play her, I guess. I gave my soul up to my legendary self. Chapter 22, The Politics of Turbulence By releasing all control, by defying every instinct which until now had ensured his survival, Jack Karakwazian was almost immediately disembodied, as was the multiverse. Aware of inchoate, seething chaos all around him, knowing it to be the primal material from which all else was created, and direct evidence of a sentient will, he was at last unafraid. He understood that this sentient will was only rarely capable of self-conscious self-direction upon any moral course. More often it manifested as little more than a blind urge to survive at all costs, the inheritance of the original insect, the mark of the minotaur, what, therefore, was demanded of any trained Yugador was to apply their own will, to use their own experience and intelligence together with their own moral sensibilities to create from that formless ether both shape, substance, and a natural enduring order which would be benign to the humans or those of human origin who played the game of time. It was their business to create, in short, more justice and greater predictability to improve the odds for human survival. All our players in the game of time, all have their parts, their place, their destiny, all have their chances. The fragile combination of mind and conscience, which was Mr. Jack Karakwazian, hung in turbulent ether, a void without scale, direction or coherence. Jack Karakwazian felt the terrible pull of it. It tempted him, offering him rest forgetfulness and comforting death, a kind of power, a kind of confirmation, a kind of honour, it called to his blood. The call was the most seductive Jack Karakwazian had ever experienced. As dreamily he let it claim him, he felt his very soul begin to lose substance, to dissipate, so too with his mind. 
only by a vast and remarkable effort, struggling with an enemy without form or identity, was he able to reclaim himself. And then he understood that his act of self-reclamation signalled the beginning of this new game. He had, as it were, taken hold of the grail. Kalinda, I love you. She had reached to him and she had cupped his hands in her. She had cupped his blood in her hands. It's better there, Jack. Come with me, Jack. He could not. Not then. Not until he had understood and confronted the forces which had brought him to this pass. She had spoken of the rose. Of a world at peace. He understood that the same struggle was taking place on every scale. At every level of the multiverse. A struggle that was infinitely complex. Fundamentally simple. A struggle between life and death. Life was this unfamiliar, formless ether stuff without intelligence or means of self-reproduction. Death was the empty void into which all life, undirected and without consciousness, gradually dissipated. He recalled Kalinda's talking in the early mornings as the boat picked up speed past New Auschwitz. We came into existence by some accident, Jack. But now that we exist, it is our moral duty to maintain our existence, to guarantee the existence of those who follow us. Our will is always, inevitably, the will of God. It is a will towards creativity, towards order, towards equity and justice and the rule of love. Some of us believe we are as much created by God as creating God, but there can never be any meaningful dispute in the matter, since we live only to be united with God and one with God, the true reconciliation for which all life strives. First comes the senseless, primeval struggle of form against form. Then the conflict is structured to prevent useless waste. Then the conflict is structured again so that all shall understand its rules. Then structured again so that the element of direct violence is removed. Then it is changed into games and from games into mathematics and stories until the stories and the maths grow more and more to represent the complexity that is a reality comprising an almost infinite number of individual sensibilities. What we call reality in every meaning is the consensual will, unconscious perhaps, of the majority of souls, the will of the just. All form struggles for consciousness, Jack. For it is through consciousness that form survives. Those who employ the instincts of the beast are ultimately devoured, yet often they are the ones who seem to triumph. He recalled every moment of her conversation now, every nuance. It was as if she had been preparing him so long ago for this time. No, Kalinda, he said, I love you, I will not perish. Jack Caraquazian could remember the sound of her silk dress in the hush of the Mississippi summer night, when the moon was high and the flat waters of the bayou mirrored every star. He could bring all that back, her scent, the touch of her, the delicate, beautiful tensions of his uncertain love. You can make it come out however you like, Jack. Make sure you keep a little confidence in your luck. She had kissed him on the cheek sweet intimacy of a moth's wing. In the Medusa, Jack Karakwazian had studied earlier musical ages. For a while he had developed a perverse fascination for the weird, whitey jazz of the 1920s and 30s, not his usual taste at all. He remembered a Roy Summers band recording from October 3rd, 31, with the saxophonist Dan Donovan singing, This is the day of days. In the background, the distinctive chords of Tommy Blade's xylophone. Note by note, the exaggerated syncopation and rapid beat came back to him, and as he recalled the tune, the instruments and harmonies, all the colours of the music, it seemed to Jack Caraquazian that his love for Kalinda de Vero grew into an enormous symphony, which absorbed and amplified every sense until both he and his music filled the entire multiverse. As he looked about him, his own hands reinvented before his own eyes. He saw movement in the surrounding chaos, 
hints of shapes and colours and even scents and sounds which gradually began to take substance. Slowly at first and crudely. Then faster and faster the stuff building into a towering pyramid which disappeared from sight overhead. There was space, thought Jack Karakwazian with hope, so therefore there must be time. He saw that the pyramid was made of flesh. It was composed of millions of separate beings. And such beings. And they are angels, said Jack Karakwazian to himself. They are God's angels taking their battle stations in the game of time. Choir upon choir of angels rose above him accompanied by the most blissful music, the most astonishing perfumes. Winged and scintillant with weapons which burned with all the glories of paradise, with instruments of mysterious function, their robes swirling and waving as if in some heavenly wind they rose. They rose towards the Godhead. And each angelic face was the face of someone Jack Karakwazian had known or loved or admired. He saw his father and his mother, his teachers, his brothers and sisters and friends and every woman he had ever betrayed, every man he had ever killed. It seemed to Jack Karakwazian that he stood upon a wide grassy plain. Above him was the silvery pallor of an evening sky into which a huge pulsing red sun bled its light. And on either side of that globe, filling every horizon and rising into distant invisibility, rank upon rank of angels, Lucifer defying God, the forces of chaos and the forces of singularity ready for war, ready to begin the great story that was the game of time. It seemed to Mr. Karakwazian that every soul in creation who had ever lived and died, or who lived now, was represented in that ultimate equation of sentience. But even as he watched, the character of the two angelic armies changed. The one growing bizarre and complex, with individuals taking on increasingly idiosyncratic shapes like the Hindu pantheon, the Egyptian or the Chinese, and somehow blending together to form an extraordinary and beautiful whole, while the other army grew steadily more austere, resembling the ascetic warriors of his boyhood reading, its colours fading to lustreless greys and blacks and pale browns its individuals assuming an unholy similarity, no face different either in feature or expression, forming itself into a single wedge of power, a phalanx which threatened chaos with the cruel ambition of its singular nature. Here were chaos and singularity taking the purest forms of their opposition as they prepared to fight a battle neither would or could ever win, but which would destroy the multivoice, and sacrifice everything living to the infinite void. What hope was there? Jack Karakwazian wondered, and then turned to watch as, between these two vast assembled armies, a great cloud boiled, lazy and opulent and radiant with vivacious strength, creating its own music and harmonies as it rolled slowly through the ether, seeming to sing. Gradually it became possible to perceive the size of the cloud and also its form. This was the spammer gain, tolerant and invulnerable, content with her fishlings around her. A mighty organism swimming carelessly through the gathered armies of the apocalypse, glowing with constantly changing colours and planes, turning eyes which were the size of galaxies to regard the combatants with sorrow. There were few amongst those two angelic hosts who did not seem shamed by her distress. But the stories must continue, cried the Rose. The conflicts must be structured and explained. There can be no cessation to, of the game of time. That will mean the cessation of existence itself. Jack Karakwazian denied this. At a particular moment he brought the multiverse back into the void, he and a million souls like him. Spontaneously, unconscious of all others, he recreated the multiverse in order at last to be reunited and no peace with Kalinda de Vero. The Rose had understood his power. His power and his luck is what she herself gambled upon. It was what she had promised him. Ah, Kalinda. 
I will conquer this inchoate infinity. I will give it form. I will do whatever is necessary to ensure that I stand beside you once more. Chaos reared and was again a pyramid of glorious variety. A host which flashed with all the colours of the spectrum. With brass and gold and silver and copper. With platinum and steel. And through it all those same familiar faces and uncountable numbers rose in a great scintillating tower of creation. Pulsing like living jewels. Their beauty rich enough to breathe. Strong enough to sustain all human need. They rose surely to the Godhead, to challenge that phalanx which was the bleak threat of a near invincible singularity. Firm ranks of hard faced soldiers, countless numbers of them, trained to demand only victory, disciplined to serve only one idea, embodied in one human master, one greater being comprising the singularity. Old Reg the original insect. Only the latter's reality was ever disputed amongst them. The former, never. They prepared for a battle which, when in some unguessable future it came, must ultimately determine the nature of reality. Jack thought again of Kalinda. How could such cosmic actualities depend so much upon a few familiar human emotions? Upon love and faith and luck. As Jack Karakwazian gradually reclaimed his physical identity from the ether, he took a deep breath like a newborn child and inhaled with a shock the fetid stink of the beast. It was only then that he truly understood how not all life survived through superior intellect or knowledge in the game of time. Other kinds of vitality had been drawn into this fresh reality by the psychic gravity generated by himself and those who had individually and without mutual influence between them somehow recreated the cosmos. A multiverse of possibilities obeyed the new laws Jack Karakwazian and his kind had built from the stuff of chance. But the new were still threatened by the old, still threatened by the beast. Only through playing the game of time could Mr. Karakwazian make sense of the struggle. They formalised their war, just as the laws of chivalry had once determined the stages of a battle. Without those laws, the complex mathematics, conflict itself was almost impossible. It was the means by which the parties could avoid stasis, establish a time, a place and a prize. Thus wars were turned into tournaments and tournaments into sports. And so too the beast was tamed, but never banished. Now all he could do was play. Even as Jack Karakwazian watched, listening to the opulent disharmony that was chaos and the steady, horrifying drumbeat of the singularity, he saw them swirl suddenly and change into complicated patterns of raw, violent energy. Chaos was no longer flesh. It had become whirling golden leaves and green blossoming clouds. It had become hectic and whimsical, trembling through the entire catalogue of colour, a measureless palette of shade and nuance. While the grey singularity, stark and cold and consistent, as simplified and specialised as a shark, hovered, ready to strike at the very centre of the blood-red rose, at the very heart of chaos, to devour all that wild energy, tame it, enslave it, pervert it to the service of the original insect. No, Kalinda. Where was she? He existed only because his desire for her to exist was stronger than his own will to survive. She had found him once when he had tried to avoid her in their early days, standing by the bar of the Lazarus Saloon on Rue Royale. One day we shall dance together, Jack, and that dance shall determine our destiny, and it will be a destiny which joins us together for eternity. He had smiled and refused to engage her, pointing out the virtues of the Z-band which had just come up on the stage. Soon her words were drowned by Les Flamers d'en Feuille. Again, Jack Karakwazian yelled into the void, defying death, refusing defeat and still claiming his Kalinda. 
All he wanted was that she should exist, that she should survive, and he would die if necessary to achieve that. Now the battle was once more transformed. He saw all the races and nations of mankind, people upon people, army upon army, race upon race, with their bold banners and armour, their chariots and horses and their war machines, their ships and their flyers, all the people who had ever existed and all those who might come to exist. This immeasurable army represented every stage of the human journey. It marched, it seemed to Mr. Karakwazian, into a mirror. People against people, army against army, race against race, individual against individual, forever at war, forever marching into the mirror, forever swallowed up in the game of time. And yet the struggle could never be determined by conflict. That was obvious to Jack Karakwazian. There must be some means of resolving this, said Jack Karakwazian. Some compromise which could be reached. Some sublime equation. He knew exactly what he was testing, and that this time there would be no punishment. The gods had lost their power over him. He had successfully challenged their mathematics. Kalinda, in Jack's lonely voice, was a hint of his old confidence, his old vision. Kalinda. Again Jack Karakwazian saw the angelic host mounted in a great pyramid, saluting the pinnacle where a gold and silver figure, Saint Mikhail, as Jack Karakwazian knew him, lifted a burnished blade, as if recognising the source of all creation, the Godhead itself. Once more that indescribable music filled Jack Karakwazian's soul. Had he been able, he would have wept. Jack Karakwazian understood that God had created an enemy when he had created the profoundly mysterious idea of free will, which was the ultimate triumph of chaos, a reality sustained entirely by conscious consensus. It was not for God to reconcile us, Jack Karakwazian would say when he was told the story. It was for all of us to achieve reconciliation. But old Ridge would have none of it. The idea of shared and equal responsibility sickened him, he said. How could existence be controlled, examined and predicted? Civilization would decline to savagery in a matter of decades. The majority of beings, old Reg's orthodoxy insisted, were still in a state of childhood and needed guidance, not power. Stability came only from a common leader. A benign father who would stop this petty squabbling and end the spread of spiritual pestilence, the inroads that chance had already made upon their lives. Old Reg's arguments made sense to Jack Karakwazian. Why risk more bloodshed, more agony and horror? Where was compassion? When it became clear to him that he was by nature better suited to serving the singularity, Jack Karakwazian was not sure why he supported the cause of chaos. Kalinda had spoken of slower time, of security and peace. How could chaos possibly achieve such a state? It must be the singularity that Kalinda served. He looked and he saw the face of the original insect. There was a cold, rational wisdom there. But he saw no compassion at all. Why not play for the singularity? Play for the rule of law and the security of simplification? Jack, said Kalinda, standing beside him as the cool dawn came up over the roof of the Van Beek Hotel and the crows went crying into the air above Mud Island. You should give it up, Jack. You should conquer this urge of yours to control. It can lead only to damage and destruction. It can lead only to decay. Jack Karakwazian watched those massed angelic ranks, winged and splendid, moving in a dance which was some kind of conversation. Their spiritual and intellectual development was inconceivable to him. They were able to speak a thousand languages and were fluent in at least as many mathematical systems. They were learned and wise and courageous beyond the imagination of any mortal, belonging neither to past nor present, but undoubtedly to some miraculous future when he and his people would reach at last some further stage in their unsteady progress towards a state of grace. 
swords burned against the heavens. Supernatural horses reared and bellowed. The multiverse was filled with the scent of roses as the angelic armies opened their glorious mouths and cried out their joy. Cried out in the fulfilment of a prophecy which told how chaos and the singularity must be reconciled and how only through that reconciliation could order come to the multiverse of mankind. But when would this re reconciliation come? Was it not already too late? Banners blazed. The horses snorted and their fabric was white fire. Their hooves struck gashes into the very fabric of existence and revealed the terrible empty regions of limbo, which even now threatened to gulp down their fragile wall against reality. Kalinda, said Jack Karakwazian, it must be you. You are my inspiration. And it was as if the armies had heard his voice and they drew back from the conflict. And as Jack Karakwazian watched, he saw each angel, one by one, foes and friends, kneel and bow their heads as if they understood at last what thin barriers separated them from endless death. They kneeled, arrayed upon the brink of time, upon the very ledge of darkness, beyond which was nothing, and beyond which there never could be anything. They had arrived at the gates of entropy, through which all sentient life must pass at last. The angels kneeled, apparently in prayer. A hush fell upon the multiverse. They must decide now if they will pass through those gates, or turn and compromise. One way leads to pride and death, and the other to humility, love and life. They must decide how much they value life. But first there must be further moves made in the game of time. The complexities, as well as the simplicities, must be reflected and celebrated. Sam Oakenhurst must be sacrificed. The Rose must achieve her victory. Jack Karakwazian must play his best and final hands. Jack Karakwazian is sleeping. He is dreaming. But now, Jack, Kalinda seems to be saying to him, now you must rejoin the game. There is much for you to do. Take your place again. It is your duty to steer the destiny of Pearl Peru. With melancholy reluctance, Jack Karakwazian returns to the game. Now he understands exactly what it is he will lose should he fail.